Okay, so now that we are, uh, we're moving along, um, I, I want to welcome you and uh, say that it's great to see you. Um, I, I think that economic conversations in the black community are very, very important. They're probably the most important conversations that we could be having um, in this generation. Um, I believe that things like the wealth gap, um, I think that the way we even view the wealth gap uh, should be open for question. Um, I think that we have to be able to really build wealth and kind of get ourselves caught up economically in a way that doesn't leave us super obsessed with what white people are doing. Um, I think that when you kind of look at white people as your gold standard, as your benchmark, um, it's really a form of white supremacy because effectively what you're doing is you're putting them on a pedestal and you're saying, you know, even though these people, you know, not, not all white people, not, this is not anti, an anti-white statement, it's just an anti-white supremacy statement. But even though these, uh, this collective of people, you know, has, has done a lot of harm to us, has abused us <clears throat> and mistreated us, what we really want most is for them to accept us, right? You know, even though you don't like us, what we really want is for you to uh, bring us in. You know, uh, if you, you know, you, you've stolen from us, but we really just kind of want to be just like you. And I'm going to show you a video in a second um, that, uh, you know, you guys can see it if you're in the webinar on, on the Black Financial Channel. Um, I'm going to show you a video in a second that explains exactly why you don't want to emulate uh, capitalism as it's been done in the United States. Why American capitalism, actually, the way it's practiced here is not healthy. Um, it's very exploitative. And basically, the same things that have been done to Black people in America have been done to people all around the world, particularly people of color. I mean, this is not something that is unique to you. Um, there's actually this video, uh, someone sent me the video this morning, but I thought it was right on time. Uh, and it basically uh, has to do with what they call these economic hitmen. And uh, basically these economic hitmen were individuals who uh, learned something that, I think Samuel Adams said this a long time ago, that if you want to enslave a, a country or a group of people, uh, you don't enslave them with, you don't have to enslave them with guns or weapons, you enslave them with debt. You enslave them with debt. So many of you, if you if you are a uh, if you are a um, former or college graduate or former college student who is trying to figure out how to pay back student loans, raise your hand. Just, just say something. Just say you know I'm I, I, me too. Whatever it is right. Maybe you need a me too movement for uh, for the financial harassment and exploitation and financial assault that takes place. Uh, with American universities. Like th that's what you, you need a Me Too movement for that stuff too, because basically um, the amount of, uh, of economic agony that's been imposed on, uh, on a lot of people, black, white, and otherwise, uh, as a result of student loan debt is a perfect example of, uh, of how debt can be used to trap you and to enslave you into a system. So effectively, the reason that you feel enslaved because of your student loan debt or the reason you feel trapped, some of you feel trapped by it, is because this massive debt, which was created, um, it, it's really, it was really a figment of someone's imagination, but th this imaginary debt that's been created uh, that has to be paid back with real money, um, you know, locks you in to being committed for life to the American economic system as a uh, low level laborer within some corporation that's owned by your oppressor. You know, you're locked in because a lot of people who are saying, well, gosh, I got to pay the student loans back, right? Um, and, they, and think about this, you're locked in because you've got the debt. Uh, you don't have other ways to make money. You never were taught things like entrepreneurship or ways you can make a lot of money really fast. Um, the way I was able to attack my student loan debt was by becoming an entrepreneur because I was able to accelerate my earning potential to allow me to, to attack the debt a little bit faster than I could have if I would sat there and just made like, you know, you know, regular wages at a corporation, right? Uh, and so, so you don't have other ways to earn additional money. And effectively, um, you know, you're kind of locked into this process where you're paying back all this money with interest. Uh, you have to keep this job you don't like in order to do that. And because you're paying off this debt with interest, you don't have any money left over to save or invest or to actually become a wealth builder. So you become kind of a, a laborer in the system, you're a hamster on the wheel. And, um, and I'm gonna talk about some solutions to that in a second. But I want you to know that this is not just something that is done 
to college students. You know, it's not something that's just done to uh, black people. This is something that is done to people all throughout the world, all over the world. This is being done and, uh, and it's being done in a more vicious way. So let me share this video with you all. This is a video from a person that says he's a self-proclaimed former economic hitman, former economic hitman. You might say, well, what is an economic hitman? Well, an economic hitman is basically a person who uses economics as a weapon to do a hit on somebody, right? Uh, if you understand the power of money, you understand how economics can be weaponized. And if you understand money the way I understand it, the way Russell Price understands it, my friend who's in here, he's a professor at Howard University, he's my homeboy, we go back 20 years. If you understand economics at our level, you understand how, how wealth and money and finances can, can literally open the door to the ultimate pimp game. It can literally open the door to, uh, to enslavement for life if you're not careful. Uh, but what happens, I think, with, with Black people in America is that because we're on this white supremacy thing and we're on this sort of you know, equality inclusion track where we're trying to get acceptance by people who have, have exploited us for many, many centuries, um, we become easy targets for the economic hit game because uh, we do everything you need to do in order to be properly pimped, right? We don't have a hunger or an appetite for freedom. Uh, we, we consider courageous people to be stupid, right? Conscious black people are made fun of, right? The conscious community, actually, they're the only people out here who are saying, let's get away from this system, but, but we make fun of them, right? Uh, also, we don't have a lot of resources to begin with relative to white folks. Uh, but three, we don't, we don't really pursue or value financial literacy or financial education as a fundamental part of being black in America, right? It's not so much our fault. Somebody put that in our head, but we refuse to take it out of our head. We refuse to shift to an educational model that allows uh, economic and financial literacy to be a part of black culture. It's very, very difficult for me to implement that. I can implement that in a, maybe in 100,000 families that I've interacted with over the course of me doing everything I'm doing, but I can't do that um, for, all, for the entire black community because I run into black people every day who are heavily resistant to anything that differs from what they're accustomed to. You know, so they will go and gladly listen to a white professor at a big white university that's going to put them $200,000 in debt, but they won't listen to black people who have knowledge, who are trying to actually educate the community on how some of this stuff works, right? So basically, we open ourselves to that pimping. And then, and then you go deeper than that uh, to the fact that education is not valued in our community the way it should be. We glorify and we worship the mumble rappers who make our children proud to be stupid. We, we worship that. We like that. We think that's cool. We think that if you're talking proper, you're acting white. Or if you're educated, you're acting white. Or if you're reading books, you're acting white. And so basically, we, we are just a prototype. We are just a practice training ground for what American capitalism has done all throughout the world. And let me play this video from this economic hitman so you guys can know exactly what I'm talking about. Some people don't believe it if a black man says it. So let me let a white man say it. Maybe it'll translate better for you that way. So let this white man tell you what white people are doing. Maybe then you'll believe what the hell I'm talking about. Check it out. On personal history, I think it's fair to say that since the end of World War II and increasingly in the most recent decades, we have managed to create the world's first truly global empire. And it's the first empire that's been created primarily without the military. It's been created by economic hitmen, by people like what I once was. And we work many different ways, economic hitmen, but perhaps the most um, common is that we will identify a third world country that has resources our corporations covet, like oil, and then arrange a huge loan to that country from the World Bank or one of its sisters. But the money never goes to the country. Instead, it goes to our big corporations to build infrastructure projects, power plants, highways, industrial parks, things that benefit a few very rich people in that country, as well as our own corporations, but don't help the majority of the people who are too poor to buy electricity, don't have the skills to get jobs in industrial parks, don't own cars to drive on the highways. And yet those very people the whole country is left holding a huge debt so that it can't pay for education and social services and health care for its people. In fact, the debt is so huge by intent that at some point we economic hitmen go back and we say, listen, 
you owe us a lot of money. You can't repay your debt, so sell your oil real cheap to our oil companies without regard to the environment. Vote with us on the next critical United Nations vote. Send troops in support of ours to some place in the world like Iraq. And in that way, we've created this empire. On the few case times when we economic hitmen fail, um, as I talk about in, in the books, as I failed in, in Ecuador with Jaime Roldos and in Panama with Omar Torrijos, then the jackals go in. And these are men, maybe a few women, who overthrow governments or assassinate their leaders. So if I'm, not, if I'm unable to bring them around, if the economic hitman is unable to bring them around through legal means, what we do is we use legal means through the World Bank, but it's basically corrupting the leaders of these countries. If we're unable to corrupt them, then the jackals go, over, go in and take care of them. So when I failed with Jaime Roldos in Ecuador and Omar Torrijos in Panama, the jackals assassinated them. And if the jackals fail, which is what happened in Iraq, both the economic hitmen and the jackals failed with Saddam Hussein, then and only then does the military go in. So this is the first empire in the history of the world that's been created primarily without the military. The military only is the last resort. And I think there's something extremely dangerous about this. It's not just that it's pathetic. It's not just that it goes against all of our most sacred documents. It's extremely dangerous because we claim to be a democracy. And a democracy is built on the assumption that the electorate is informed. And if the electorate doesn't realize what we're doing internationally, if the electorate doesn't understand the main basis of our foreign policy, which is what I've just described, then the electorate is not informed and therefore cannot vote intelligently. And therefore, you even have to question whether we're truly a democracy. Forget about on purpose. Okay, so let me let me break that down, and uh, let's kind of analyze this video a little bit uh, because you know there's a lot to um, unpack from what he just said. So there's there's a lot to uh, kind of analyze in terms of what uh, what this man said. I'm, I'm glad that that people like him are out here talking about this uh, because it's a very simple model. <laughs> now remember, as I was explaining to you, that um, ultimately. Uh, you know, the idea of the economic hitman is built around this uh, reality that money is power, right? And power can be used uh, to achieve a lot of different goals. Power can be used to protect. It can be used to provide. It can be used to clear a path. It can be used to exploit. It can be used to uh, just harm somebody or take somebody out. And so effectively what he's referring to is the fact that uh, at least on a government level, and I'm going to break this down on how this affects you on a personal level, not just on a broader scale, but on a government level, you know, the, the massive and vast wealth of the United States uh, has been used uh, to basically either control uh, leaders or countries that they want to control. And if they cannot control those countries and those leaders, they just take them out. They just take them out. Uh, why? Well, because they've, they've got, you know, not just the financial resources, but they've also got uh, the military as, as a backdrop, as a backdrop. So, so a lot of your wars that you've seen over the last 50 years have been fake wars. Uh, you know, if you had a relative who died in Vietnam, they died in a war that didn't necessarily have to happen. Uh, you know, and I, I feel bad for you for even having to say that, but it's true. Iraq war, same thing, both Iraq wars, right? Uh, a lot of this stuff uh, is, is orchestrated, is created, in many cases, to take out leaders that won't go along with the program. So, so basically, the U.S. government kind of operates sort of like um, a street gang, like the bullies in the neighborhood who go around to all the little shop owners and say, um, we want a piece of what you got. And the shop owners that say that are, that are, that are intimidated, they say, OK, sure, 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 we'll, we'll pay you off for your protection. Right. If you give us money, we'll protect you. Right. And really, they're saying we'll protect you from us. Right. And so you say, OK, I'll pay you for your protection. Right. And then some people say, no, I'm not paying you for your protection. Right. Well, then obviously there's going to be consequences for that. Next thing you know, uh, the shop burns down. Next thing you know, uh, you know, somebody, the, own, the owner of the store gets killed. Right. And so effectively, this is kind of what's been happening, um, you know, for many, many years uh, in the United States. Uh, this is 
the use of money and debt as a process for the enslavement of other people. Uh, it's, it could have been used in your life. It's probably, it's definitely been used in your life by white supremacy. White supremacy uses economics to control and manage black people on a regular basis. Uh, what do they do? First of all, think about this. Most of your major black media outlets are not owned by black people. Most of them are owned by white people. The root.com is owned by white people. Uh, BET is owned by white people. And so basically, um, they, you know, they, they use their vast wealth to control these media outlets to make sure that they, they shape the narrative and the message that black people receive. And if you have leadership that can't be corrupted, if you have black people out here, you know, the Farrakhan's or whomever, people that are trying to tell you the truth, then what they'll do is they will use their economic power to uh, marginalize or to destroy those people. If they can't, if they can't properly control the community or control the leader, then they'll just take the person out. Now, fortunately, most of the uh, time when they take them out, they don't actually kill them like they used to. They did kill Malcolm and Martin, but uh, but you know, but now it might be just you know some sort of political assassination. You know, uh, you have somebody that's getting out of pocket. Next thing you know, there's some media created scandal that leads to Bill Cosby going to jail for something that nobody ever actually proved, right? Uh, you know, and, and again, I, is this happening exactly with Cosby? I don't know. Uh, is Cosby completely innocent? I don't know. But I do know that there's a reason why he was hanging out with a lot of white guys, probably doing a lot of the same stuff, but he's the one that went to prison and they didn't. Well, that's an example of how economic hitmen might operate in terms of using their vast wealth and resources. Remember, wealth isn't just money. Wealth is also control of media outlets, just control of, of the educational system. There's a lot of other forms of wealth that can be used to exert power on other people. And uh, and one of the things that one of the wealth tools that's used to exploit and control black people is the media itself. They, they love to sort of reshape and create narratives. If you look in Hollywood and you look at the way uh, black people are portrayed in Hollywood, uh, what they're doing is they're trying to send a message, right? Uh, whatever it is, whatever their agenda happens to be, they're sending that message to black people to try to manage and control black people to keep us in line with the process that allows them to exploit us, right? Uh, you know, because because they, it's hard for them to exploit you if you say, look, I'm not sending my kids to the white public schools. Uh, I, I'm not letting my kids listen to this garbage on the radio. I'm not having my children go work for a white corporation. They're going to go start their own business. Well, they don't make money off that. Right. They make money when you are going to that public school, because even if they're failing your child and your child's not getting an education, they're still getting their money. So they don't care. Uh, they, they make money when your child when you go two hundred thousand dollars in debt to go to a big white university. Uh, why it does this matter that your degree isn't worth very much or doesn't get you what you want? No, they don't care because they got they got paid, right? It benefits them when you go and you work for that white corporation building someone else's empire instead of building things for your own community. Uh, and, and so the list kind of goes on and on and on, right? So basically the same process that you in which in which white supremacist economic power is used to control and exploit black people is actually being applied around the world. Now, what the economic hitman was referring to in this video is he was referring to uh, to how uh, you know this uh, America as a global economic superpower uses that influence to go throughout the world, and they will point out other countries and they'll say, "Huh, this little third world country has a lot of oil, and we need oil. We want to have oil." And not, we don't just want to have oil to survive. We are greedy capitalists. And, and the thing about capitalism as, at its worst, this is why I don't want everybody to be uh, an Americanized capitalist, because you're, you're not good for the world if you think this way. The way the greedy capitalist thinks is the greedy capitalist doesn't think, OK, I want to get enough for me and my people to survive. The greedy capitalist says, well, I have enough to survive, but I want to have it all. I want to have everything. So if I've got four pieces of chicken, and I only need one to be full, but I got four, and I see you got two, and I see that you look tiny, and you look like a little punk, like I can whoop your ass and take your chicken, I'm going to be like, hmm, I think I'm going to stab him in the neck and take his chicken too, right? And that's kind of how capitalism uh, processes the world, and that's why so many people hate America. If you ever want to know, if you're ever confused about why so many people just can't stand our country, well, that's a big part of the reason why. You know, it's, it's the greed. And, and a lot of American corporations are built on extreme greed. You know, it doesn't matter if they made $10 billion last year. If the, if the new CEO can't figure out how to make $11 billion next year, then they're going to be looking to get him fired, right? And so in order to, uh, to maintain this very gluttonous, um, you know, gluttonous chase for money, uh, you have to constantly go throughout the world finding people to pick on, finding people 
to beat them up where, they could, so where you could beat them up and take their lunch money, beat them up and take their chicken. So the economic hitmen will go to these third world countries that are struggling economically and they will say, oh, we want to help you. We want to help you build infrastructure in your country. And so what will occur is they'll go in the United States might use their influence with the um, the International Monetary Fund or the World Bank. And they'll go and they'll say, you know, we think this tiny country should get a loan for $50 billion, right? So they can build, you know, railroads and, and, and roads and, and whatever else they need, infrastructure in this country. Now, when the loan comes out, here's the thing. What they're really kind of saying is we want you to loan the money to them so they can give it right back to us, right? So, so we'll, we'll say to the country, look, we'll hook you up and get you a loan as long as you agree to, um, to allow us to be the provider of the services that you, that you get when you get the loan, right? So it's like a student loan. It's like a student loan. The student loan is where the university tells the government, loan this person $200,000 so they can pay us to give them an education that's probably worth about 10 grand. Right. So they're literally saying to you as a student, they're saying they're saying, look, we can go to the government. Don't worry. You have, we, we know it's 50,000 a year to go to Howard or to go to Yale or whatever. It, it, it's costing too much. But we'll go to the government. We'll get them to loan you 200 grand so you can get <clears throat> so, so that we can you can give us the money <clears throat> that they loan to you. And, and we'll give you an education. How about that? How does that sound? How does that sound for opportunity? Right. And you're like, OK, bet. Let's do it. I want to go to college. College is a way to, for me to improve my life. Right. And, and so you go to school and you get all this debt and they got the benefit. You pay the cost. You're paying the debt later. Well, well, they do that with third world countries. So they'll say to the country, look, we know that you need help. We know you need infrastructure. We know you need roads and bridges and everything else. So we're going to go to the World Bank and we're going to get them to loan you enough money to pay us to come and build bridges and roads in your country. Now we're, we're going to overcharge the shit out of you. I mean, but who cares? It's all, it's all, they're going to, it's all going to get covered. They're going to go and, and, uh, and, you know, they're going to go and they're going to, um, you know, they're, they're going to, they're going to pay it all off. They're going to pay. Don't worry about that. Right. And, and now here's the thing in the, in the countries, the little complication that makes it different from the student loan example I gave you is that they're not really talking to the people of that country, right? Because the, amongst the people, you're going to have people that are concerned about the people. You're going to have people in there that are financially intelligent. You're going to have people that are going to think about the long-term consequences of taking on that much debt, especially if the country itself is not getting the, the long-term benefits of, of taking on that debt, right? So, so, so they're not talking to the people of that country. They're talking to the leaders, you see. They're going to the leaders, and they're saying to the leaders, look, you've got the power to sign this piece of paper. Just sign this piece of paper and we're gonna make sure you and your family are good. We're gonna, we, you know, you and your family will have $50 million in the bank and you'll be able to, you know, send your children to London to go to college and 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 they're gonna be doing really well economically. And, and you know, yeah, you know, the people and the people will benefit because they're gonna get bridges and roads, right? It's gonna be awesome, right? It's gonna be cool, yeah, right? So 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 you kind of, so, so the leadership, uh, th those are the ones who sell out you know, parts of Africa. Those are the ones who sell out third world countries a lot of times as the leaders. Now, you might say, well, why would these leaders do that? Why do these countries have these bad leaders? Well, because a lot of times these leaders are not democratically elected. This is where, um, where the jackals come in. So the hitmen come in and try to get the country deep in debt. The jackals come in if, if the hitmen can't achieve their goal straight up. If they run into leaders they run into, again, the Farrakhan types that they, they say, no, I'm here for the people. I want to make sure the people are taken care of, right? So the deal might be a good deal if the people benefit, right? So, so if the hitmen can't succeed, then they call in the jackals. The jackals come from like the CIA, like George W. Bush, that old man that just died. He was the head of the CIA. So basically the jackals come in, it, you know, and, and, and basically they say, oh, so the leader, so Gaddafi won't go along with the program? Oh, we're gonna make sure we'll make sure that he ain't breathing next year, right? Or whatever, whatever leader is, you know, whatever whoever the leader is, they did they done it in Iran. That's why the Iranians hate the United States. They've done it all over the world. So the jackals will come in and they will make sure that the leader is taken out. So they'll do it in a few different ways. They might create dissent, um, and they do this. They do this actually uh, not just globally. Remember, everything they're doing globally, they're doing it to you. Right. The, the, uh, you know, the same way they might go to a third world country to get rid of the leaders who won't go along with the program by creating dissent or funding uh, their enemies. 
you know, by giving them either weapons or, or, or political support, right? Maybe money for marketing so they can market a message that undermines the leadership, right? They do things like that to, to make the people themselves start to question their own leaders. So sometimes they'll just vote in a new person because they've been convinced that their current leader is no good, right? Well, the same thing that happens there, it happens here. That's what they did, you know, with the Black Panthers. They were like, okay, we need to get rid of these authentic leaders and replace them with puppets. So what we're going to do is we're going to create dissent. We're going to drop some plant. We're going to plant some people into the Black Panthers. They're going to go in there and just raise hell. They're going to go in there and question the leaders. They're going to go in there and talk shit. They're going to go in there and and make up rumors. They're going to go in there and attack and get you to and discredit the leaders so they so that they can be replaced by somebody else. Right. And uh, and that ha that's happened all over the world. It's happened back then in the, you know, in the U.S. It, it happened. It's happening now in the United States. I just don't know where it's happening. I had a great conversation with Anthony Broward uh, on a plane uh, who actually was telling me that he believes that there are some people in the conscious community right now who are very visible, who have been planted to simply make people not believe in uh, in the mission or not make people not believe in people that they already believe in to just create chaos to make the whole movement look crazy and stupid, right? And so ultimately, and again, who are these people? I don't know exactly who they are. I'm not in with, you know, with the CIA, but this is a typical tactic. If I just simply get you to not be sure about your leadership, then I've achieved my goal because you're not gonna follow something that is ambiguous. You only follow things that are crystal clear. Uh, so in fact, one of the reasons why I do so many videos and I'm so straightforward about everything I'm thinking and I talk to you every single day is because my thought is if there is somebody being planted to make to discredit me or to create chaos or to make people not believe in, in what I'm doing, you can look me in the eye and just know that you know that what you're seeing is who I am. That you can watch ten thousand videos that say, "Yeah, voice is pretty much the same consistent weirdo that he is in every video. He's a little weird, but but he's saying something that actually makes sense." So you can see that in my eyes. You can see who I am. You can hear my voice, right? I'm talking to you directly, and I'm doing that deliberately so that um, so that you can't be shaken, or or it's very difficult to shake somebody if they feel like they know you, if they're there, if they're hearing from you, it's, you know over and over again, right? But then also the other thing that's really important, and again, this is uh, this is bringing it back home in terms of why I operate the way I operate. The other piece of that is, I wanna remind you consistently that all of this is not about one or two people. You know, this is not about me as a so-called leader in the community. It, it ain't about me. It ain't about what faith you have in Boyce Watkins. It ain't about what you think, whether you think I'm the greatest in the world or you think I'm a scumbag. That's not what it's about. It's about the mission of elevating black people and believing in black economic empowerment as a pathway and as a legitimate tool for black people to achieve our goals in the 21st and 22nd century. That's what it's all about. So my thought has always been, if I go out here tomorrow and somebody just shoots me on the street and I'm dead, I need people to be committed to the idea, not to the man, not to the, not to the group. You don't do that, you commit to the idea. And then that way you say, yeah, you know, yeah, they 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 shot Boyce and left him in this bathtub with a pound of heroin and 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 and, and left images saying that you know that left pictures on his computer saying that he was having sex with baby puppies you know in the middle of the night whatever. But I so 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 screw Boyce. But uh, I don't know about Boyce, but I know that this that black economic empowerment is an important tool because I understand that from the core of my soul. You see, that's about really when people talk about finding the God in you. Um, I believe that there's a God in you that can make your own decisions, that can understand uh, what's going on without necessarily having a leader dragging you around by your hair and telling you what to think, right? So I don't, I don't believe in that. I don't believe in, 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 in charismatic leadership that much. I think charismatic leadership can get people's attention, especially Black folks, because we, we can get caught up with you know, bright, shiny objects. But I really think the goal at the end of the day is to get our community away from charismatic leadership and move toward um, you know, a systematic leadership, uh, institutional leadership, and, and, and leadership based on ideas and principles as opposed to believing that one guy is the greatest human being in the history of the world. This ain't about worship. You, hero worship, you always lose because they can always destroy your heroes. So anyway, let me keep it going. Let me, let me move on. Um, so, so the economic hitman basically said, that you know, we use our wealth to try to control people and control governments, get them doing what we want. If that doesn't work, we send in the jackals. The jackals are designed to, um, or their 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 job is to go in and to eliminate 
the leaders that they don't approve of, the leaders that are not pursuing their agenda. They send the jackals in to make people not believe in the leader, to uh, get the, make sure the leader's not elected, or to assassinate the leader. Well, uh, it, it, it was funny about this whole Trump and Russia collusion, which I do believe Trump is deeply in bed with Russia, just from what I know about Trump and economics and all. Remember, I read a book by Donald. I read Donald Trump's book, Art of the Deal, 27 years ago. I, I That was back when he, people admired him. A lot of the same rappers that you know talk shit about Trump now Go back 20, 10, 15 years. They they were big up. They were giving Trump big ups back in the day. So I just think it's all stupid anyway. I just had my own opinion about him from the jump, which was that he's an arrogant white man, but he knows a little bit about business. And I didn't love him. I didn't hate him. I just didn't give a damn. Right. Uh, but but everybody's all emotional. So I know it is what it is. But anyway, the thing about Trump and Russia, Russian collusion is that it's very real. Uh, Trump is in bed with Russia. I have no doubt about that, because if you look at the nature of his business deals in Russia all through the years, it speaks directly to um, you know, that that type of corruption. Now, where I become cynical is that I believe all the politicians were corrupt. If you look at Obama's track record and the, the relationships Obama had, you know, you can see where Obama's influence came from. If you look at Bush and the nature of Bush's business and political relationships, you can see where his influence was. So all these presidents are influenced in some way. I think that where what's unique about Trump's Russian collusion is that, you know, basically Russia is trying to do to, to the United States what the United States has done to countries all over the world. That's what's interesting about it. The United States is like, wait a minute, we're the pimps. We're not supposed to be the hoe. You don't put, you don't take the pimp and put the pimp in a mini skirt on the corner like that. You, you, you can't do that. You can't do that to us. And I'm like, no, you do it to everybody else. So yeah, it's gonna, it's somebody gonna try to do it to you too. China's doing it to you. Russia's doing it to you. And some of your allies may be doing it to you. Uh, so anyway, so so what, he, what the guy was saying was that you send in the hitmen. Uh, to, to basically control the country with debt, get them deep in debt, but don't give them the actual money for the people. You take that money and you give it to uh, American corporations that will come in and do all the projects. So you're really not giving them any economic benefit. You're just overcharging them to get them to, you know, to, to where they can take that money. And you can go in and make profits for your corporation by building them a bunch of fancy stuff. If the leaders don't go along with it, then you have uh, hitmen, uh, excuse me, jackals that come in and take out the leadership. And then if that doesn't work, then you just do an all out attack. So what you do then, like we did with Iraq, is you'll go back to, you'll go to the United States, to the American people, and you'll say, this leader is corrupt. This leader is evil. This leader is harming his own people. This leader is Satan. And everybody in America, we just kind of believe it. Like, oh yeah, he's a terrible person, blah, 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 blah. And, um, and then next thing you know, uh, you get the, the support to go and get, um, you know, and buy, you know, 10,000 Tomahawk cruise missiles or whatever, and go just blow, blow them straight to hell so that then you, the corporations can go in and, uh, and they can make money by rebuilding the country after they blow it up and destroy it. And they can also put the leadership the new leadership in place, which is exactly what we did in Iraq. Right. So effectively, you know, capitalism is out of control in America in the sense that our corporations are running our government. You know, most of our elected officials, Obama included, I hate to tell you all this, but even, even your hero Obama, were, are heavily influenced by American corporations. And the corporations are basically saying, you've got the military, you've got the CIA, you've got all these resources that we need. Um, we're we're going to have a partnership. We're going to use our economic power partnered with our uh, military power. And we're just going to go knock the hell out of any country that disagrees with us so we can go in and basically take their lunch money uh, because they know that that people are fickle. You know, the American people are easily, easily influenced by media and uh, and they can pretty much get you to hate anybody <clears throat> overnight. You know, so uh, so what that really speaks to in my mind, honestly, is that, you know, a lot, believe it or not, a lot of the stuff that, you know, where the Trumps might say, oh, this is fake media, they, they're biased against me. That's really true. They, that's really true. CNN has a vendetta against Donald Trump. But at the same time, we know on the other side, Fox News is as biased as they come. Fox News is, is their goal is to manipulate and to control. So, um, you know, I, who do you listen to as far as media? Um, I tend to pay a little bit more attention to the, the media outlets that are focused on facts as opposed to uh, a spin and opinion. So um, maybe PBS, I think I think PBS is good, although their bias is more liberal, but they tend to be focused a little bit more on facts. Um, I think that uh, outlets like, uh, you know, NBC, ABC are, are pretty good because they, they tend to do old school news. Um, it's just straight facts. Um, you know, I think that we should have more black media outlets so we can get a black perspective. But, but at the end of the day, it almost seems like everybody kind of has an agenda. So even a black media outlet has a black agenda. 
PBS has a very liberal agenda. Like they'll spend a lot of time talking about like, you know, immigrant babies being separated at the border. They ain't got nothing to say about black babies being separated for 400 years, but they'll talk all day about, you know, they'll, they'll always start off with a story. That's another little trick to do. They never really give you like, well, they won't really focus so much on the big picture of it all. They'll start with a story, you know, um, you know, little Paco and his mother, uh, Maria have traveled all the way from Ecuador and walked 400 miles. And when they got to the border, Paco was thirsty and they put him in a Walmart, you know, like they'll tell a story to sort of draw on your emotional strengths to get you to sort of start feeling sorry for Paco and make his story bigger than it actually is. Like Joseph Stalin used to say the, um, uh, what is it? I think he said, a, a, a one death is a tragedy. A million deaths is a statistic. So if you tell people in media that, you know, a million people died during this war, people are like, oh, okay, that's really sad. But if you tell them, if you tell them a story and get them emotionally attached to one person, then that one person's death can be as emotionally impactful as the death of a million people in one statistic. So anyway, uh, one of the things that, um, that I would say is that if you want to understand the nature of how, uh, how, you know, capitalism and big countries kind of exploit third world countries and poor countries. Go watch this documentary on uh, YouTube called Poverty Inc. On Poverty Inc., they kind of break that down very, very well. They explain how, um, you know, how we keep third world countries in poverty by doing charity. We think the charity is helping them, so we give money to the charity because of that, but actually it's not helping them, it's keeping them in debt. Well, why is that? Well, because you've got corporations that, like the, the, the Bill and Hillary Clinton Foundation, that will go and they will collect money um, from the American public or from the people around the world to get them to supposedly help these third world countries. They did this to Haiti. They screwed over Haiti big time. And what they're doing is they're not collecting money for Haiti and for Haitians to go and develop industry. They're collecting money for their for themselves. They're saying, pay us money, again, just like student loans. Just That's why Haiti, countries like Haiti end up in so much debt. Just like student loans, they're, they're basically saying, loan us a whole bunch of money so we can give a bunch of overpriced services to the Haitian people, right? So we're so they're not investing in any of their own money. They're taking your money and paying themselves to go do a job, right? When they could easily take that money and pay the Haitian and, and you know people to do the job for themselves. They could develop industry in Haiti, like help Haitians develop businesses and construction companies and things like that, so that Haitian people are running these companies and they're building their own infrastructure, right? You could bring you could bring five, you know, five thousand young Haitian people, bring them to the US for a while, put them in an edu educational programs that'll teach them how to develop corporations and 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 construction companies and, and companies that will build whatever products Haitians need and then send them back to the country with some of this money that you've raised right and say here here is seed capital for you to develop your own businesses and your own industry in Haiti that will allow you to rebuild your own houses you know whenever there's an earthquake to develop your own products so that your people can build their own economy right they can easily do that they can easily do that but here's the problem here's the problem if you make people independent, then that cuts off your revenue stream, right? So basically, um, they know that if they teach Haitians to fish for themselves and they teach Haitians, Haitians to own the lake or, you know, where the fish are, that the fish are in, then they know that ha Haiti's dependence on them will go away. So they can't go to people around the world and get them to make massive donations to their corporations to go give all these unwanted services to the Haitian people, right? So... Uh, again, I compare it to student loans because it's kind of the same thing, right? The university says, you know, look, we're going to charge you um, an insane amount of money for education. It's $50,000 a year to get a degree where it shouldn't cost you more than five or $10,000 a year. And what we're going to, but don't worry about the cost. We're going to go to the government and the government's going to loan you money to give to us. So it's not a loan to you. It's not a student loan to you. It's actually a loan to them. It's, it's not even a loan to them. It's free money for them. It's profit for them. It's a loan to you. So they get the benefits. You pay the cost. Right. And then what they do is they then give you a service that is heavily over overpriced and, and called a college education. You graduate with this piece of paper and you got all this debt in the other hand and you can't repay the debt. So you're pissed off because you're stuck with all this debt when really in the very beginning, you kind of got pimped the same way we pimped the third world countries. You thought that they were doing you a favor when actually they were harming you. So a better approach might be, for example, if they help, if you were able to get a loan uh, that you know, where you could go and maybe learn how to start a business at, at a much lower cost. Like, let's say you were able to get 
$5,000 to go to some place where they taught you how to be an entrepreneur and how to start your own companies and have your own industry. So that then instead of going to work for a white corporation, you could actually go back to your neighborhood and start a business. Right. And then let's say that part of the loan was also used for seed capital for your business. So first thing they let's say, let's say the first thing they do is teach you how to start and run a business. Then the second thing they do is use of the other part of the money to give you it, it, can, it can even be debt. It doesn't even have to be a, a grant or free money. It can literally still be debt. and You still benefit from debt. They gave you enough of a loan, a hundred thousand dollar loan for your business to really get off the ground. Well, at the end of the day, then next thing you know, you've got a company that's making you half a million dollars a year so you can go back and repay the hundred thousand dollars without a problem. Right. So ultimately, you know, what's being done around the world with these economic hitmen is not that much different from what's being done with student loan debt in the United States. It's just a different kind of process. So anyway, let me um, uh, those of you who are in here from the Black Business School, I'm going to answer some of your questions now. Um, if you're not if I'm not able to see your questions because you're not in the webinar, uh, just know if you if you join the Black Business School, then you can come into the Black Wealth Conversation. Uh, so feel free to go to theblackbusinessschool.com, sign up for a class, and uh, and you can come in and I'll see your questions. So I want to make sure the students get their questions answered first. So uh, if you have a question in, uh, if you're in the school and you're in the webinar and you have a question, type your question in and I'll answer your question. Um, and uh, as you guys fill in your questions, I'm going to talk about the stock market for a minute. <clears throat> now, let me... Um, let me see what the Dow is doing right now. The Dow Jones Industrial Average. <clears throat> it looks like now I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, now pay it. Now look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Some of you, those of you who are in my stock market class, I'm sure you're smiling right now. Look at the Dow today. It went up 506 points. 506 points today. You know what that makes me think about um, Shawit. Uh, and Monero, it makes me think about that song, you know, the sun will come out tomorrow. So you got to hang on till tomorrow. There will be sun, right? The Dow does this all the time. You'll have a tragic day like you had yesterday or two days ago. The, the Dow just went <laughs> crash and burn, right? And you have people that panic and freak out and say, ha ha, I told you so. You shouldn't invest. That's why I don't invest because market crashes, blah, 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 blah. And the smart investors don't fall for that stuff. The smart ones are like, yeah, it happens, but, you know, it's going to be fine. Like it usually is. Doesn't mean it's going to be fine for sure. Nobody can predict the future, but you go back 120 years. There's never been a time where the market crashed and did not recover, right? Well, look at this. Look at this. It's like life. It's like love, right? If you never go through the pain of a broken heart, then you can never appreciate the sheer jubilation of meeting somebody that you love very much, right? So sometimes in life, like they say, you have to know the pain to enjoy, to really feel the joy. So here we're getting the joy and the benefits of being an investor because here you saw the market jump a lot. Some of you made hundreds, maybe thousands of dollars this morning, right? And But if you look at the last five days, look at that. Last five days, nothing but red, blood red. Uh, if you can't see it, just go to theblackfinancialchannel.com if you can't see this graph theblackfinancialchannel.com. Uh, so you look here, you see the market just last five days, just a complete bloodbath. It's bleh, just horrible. Just, just people dying in the street, just stocks just dipping and falling and money being lost and everybody going crazy. And you look at one month, look at this, that's red too. Red means that over the course of the month, money was lost. So you hear over the course of the month, you see that we've had some pr a pretty bad month. Go back six months, not a good six months, right? Go back to the whole year. The whole year of 2018 ultimately was a money loser. Um, uh, so to go back a year, same thing. Now, remind you, let me look at, let's look at five years. If you've been an investor for five years consistently, though, look at that. It turns green again, right? So if you can see the tree, the forest, and not, and not worry about the trees, then the stock market has been an enormously good investment for you. Uh, you look down here. Go back to the beginning of this chart. You, it's as low as 15698 now the Dow is up to 20, well, it's 22,000 now, but it's gotten as high as 26,000. And if you go back and you look at this max chart, you go all the way back to 1980, the Dow was less than a thousand. So ultimately this is where your grandparents, you know, um, either did or could have made a major power move for you. This is where they really could have put you in a great position today. Um, you know, if they, in 1980, you know, we're really trying to think about the future. If they understood just this basic idea that people who control the present are usually people who were preparing for the present back when the present was the future, 
right? People who control now are people who have been planning for the future for a very long time. If they knew that principle, then what they would have done is maybe taken very small amounts of money and put it into the stock market um, over a long period of time, since back you know, in the 1980s when the market was much cheaper. They would have just bought a little bit of stock, maybe one stock every month, one stock a week or whatever they could afford. And just by doing that, even if the studies show that even if they'd randomly picked the stocks, even if they actually just bought you know, a new stock every week and didn't even think about which stock it was, I swear to God, I'm not making this up. Even if they'd done that, they would have far more wealth than they would have by not investing at all. So if you want to know um, my biggest, when people say, what's the biggest mistake you can make when it comes to stock market investing, the biggest mistake you can make when it comes to stock market investing is to not participate. That's the biggest mistake you can make. Buying the wrong stock is rarely uh, the biggest mistake investors make because by theory, and, and we explain all this, there are videos that you guys can watch on how this works in the black stock market program. But you know, the theory basically says that if you diversify like you're supposed to, and you've done that consistently, then you're not, you haven't lost money, especially if you held more than 10 years. Usually about a decade is about that line of demarcation where most, all throughout history, the losses have turned into gains, right? So maybe you have a bad month, maybe you have a bad year, maybe you have a bad three years, right? But it's rare that you have more than three, four, five, six years where you didn't eventually have gains if you were well diversified, especially in the last 30 years, last 30, 40 years, the stock market has been literally the number one way people have made money in America. And that's the number one reason that there's a gap in wealth between the rich and the poor. And so uh, don't don't go into don't fall into the ideology or the mindset that investing is evil or it's bad or it's for white people. Money ain't for white people. Money is very, very black. Having money is is a black thing. It ain't a white thing. It's a black thing. So uh, so be wealthy and be black and be smart. And that's how you're going to get a hit. Um, can I touch on uh, Trump's opportunity zones? Um, I don't know much about Trump's opportunity zones. I've heard a little bit about it. Um, I will say that, you know, that there are things there that, you know, could theoretically become common ground for parts of the black community in the Trump administration. I mean, you're going to have the guy as your president until he gets impeached or until he's not, not reelected. Um, and or maybe he's going to be reelected. I mean, I hate thinking that that's a possibility, but you never know. Who knows? I, I don't know. Um, but, you know, the thing is, you know, one piece of common ground that potentially you could look into is the fact that, you know, he seems to be a guy that believes in entrepreneurship. You know, he's a guy that believes in building your own businesses. And that's what I, I believe in that. I don't like I'm not a fan of Trump per se as a person. I wouldn't want to be his, you know, roommates with him. But, you know, it's like if we were having a common a conversation, I would probably not really spend much time talking to him about whether or not he likes me. I don't care if he likes me. I just assume most white people don't really like black people that much or don't care about us enough or as much as they care about themselves. I just, I just, maybe I'm a cynic, but I walk into a room. I don't care if you are the head of, of the ACLU. I don't care if you are the, uh, you know, the, uh, a, a long lasting member of the democratic party. I don't care about none of that. You know, that I pretty much assume honestly that if you're white, you probably don't care about black people as much as you might care about like a dog, right? Like seriously, like when a black man gets killed on the same day a dog gets killed, most white folks are concerned about the dog. They'll hold a GoFundMe and raise money for the dog. They won't create a GoFundMe to help the black man. Like that, I'm not, I'm not saying that that makes them all terrible people. I'm just saying it's a fact. Tell me if I'm right. Somebody please type in the comments, say, yep, you're right. I agree with you. They love their damn dogs. So I'm not saying that I hate them. It's just more like I, I probably hate them. I probably dislike them less than you because I don't have so much hope for them like you do. Like I like those of you who really think white people are going to come and save, um, you know, black people. I don't know where you're getting that information from. I don't know which propaganda you received that led you to believe that they have taken it upon themselves to go save the black community. So if you're telling me that black people can't save black people, um, then you're telling me that black people can't be saved, right? So, so because you have black people that will say black people can't do it by ourselves, we can't save ourselves. Well, I'm like, if black people can't save black people, then what's your alternative? Are you saying white people can save black people? And if you say white people can save black people, that they want to save black people, I don't understand what that means because I don't see how that's going to happen. So anyway, uh, let me see. Somebody, Tashina is asking about the programs. Which program is discounted this month? Well, we got a program um, for adults and one for children. So. Uh, for this month, you can get 75% off the Black Stock Market Program. 
uh, which is the program that I teach on how to invest in the stock market. There's a ton of content in there. It's really, really good. It's better than anything I ever taught at the university level. And you, you guys know I taught college students for 25 years at Syracuse, Ohio State, Indiana University, University of Kentucky. But this is better than anything I've ever taught because it allows me to teach everything um, that I want to teach without any constraints, you know, from, an, you know, an administration telling me what to teach or constraints that, you know, in college classes can only be 16 weeks long, Well, you can't teach everything in 16 weeks. Um, or, uh, or, or just the fact that I'm teaching black people, it allows me to be extra black in terms of shaping my analysis and my theories and everything else, specifically to solve that one important problem, which is uh, black economic strength, black economic security, et cetera. So uh, it's a great program. And also when you're done, make sure when you're done, if you haven't done this, if you guys are in the class and you haven't done this yet, make sure you go through all the content so you can get your degree, get your degree from the Black Business School. Some of you have been um, hashtagging Dr. Boyce Watkins or hashtagging Black Business School and taking a screenshot of your, your, your degree. Please do that. Uh, you make videos, use the hashtag Black Business School, et cetera. I'd like to take those and share those with other people because we, we need to inspire the community to understand the importance of economic freedom, economic literacy, and it's working. It's really working. Um, the rapper Meek Mill just made an amazing post and I'm going to answer your question, Tashina. I promise you. I, I tend to go. I tend to talk my way around stuff, but I I'm paying. I'm going to come back to your your question. Um, the rapper Meek Mill just made a great comment about the importance of you know rappers instead of competing on who's got the most jewels and the most cars and the most clothes, they should start competing on who owns the most property. They should start talking about who's making the most investments. They should be talking about what's going to happen with their family in the next 50 years. And I love that because that tells me that what that this pressure we're putting out on the world to really focus on economics, that it's really working. Um, and, you know, the, the first time that I saw rappers were getting on board with this was when I would hear, you know, guys like Rick Ross starting to talk about wealth building. I started hearing Jay-Z rapping about wealth building. And I specifically remember having a very long conversation with Beyonce's tour manager, um, who was managing, I guess, all her venues for her tours. And I said, you know, I, I he was trying to convince me that Jay-Z was really conscious and that Jay-Z really believes in this kind of stuff and blah, blah, blah. And we talked for hours. And I said, yeah, I hear what you're saying, but I don't really hear him saying that in his music. I said, so I don't really enjoy the idea of intelligent Black people pretending to be dumb so they can fit in. I said, I think Jay's smarter than that. I think Jay's made good economic decisions, and I would like for him to share some of that with the world. Now, I don't know if that played a part in what he said in 444. I have no idea. He did not give me props on any of that. But I was happy that Jay shifted his trajectory to really talk about what, what I call Black common sense. Black common sense means that maybe we shouldn't have our black artists telling our children that it's good to go to prison. Maybe black common sense says maybe it's good that we tell black people not to just give all their money away. Maybe we'll have more money if we don't give it all away. Uh, black common sense says maybe we shouldn't uh, encourage young black men to commit genocide on one another and to kill each other. Maybe that does hurt the community if we're encouraging young people to kill each other. I don't know. And, uh, and so now you're seeing rappers kind of getting that and getting the courage to express that black intelligence, that real black excellence through their music. And so I wanted to be one of the first to congratulate Meek Mill on, on really saying what I think rappers should say and what they can say probably better than me. Uh, they can influence people that won't listen to me. And I really want them to keep going with that message. And I want to support them 100%. Now, uh, Tashina, which programs are discounted? First, uh, you can get 75% off a lifetime membership in the Black Stock Market Program. If you go to theblackstockmarketprogram.com, you can get 75% off through the, uh, just for this month only. So go to theblackstockmarketprogram.com. Don't forget the T-H-E, theblackstockmarketprogram.com. Also, our children's programs. We have 75% off of that. There are two children's programs. Uh, one is blackmillionairesoftomorrow.com. At blackmillionairesoftomorrow.com, that's a four-in-one package. So there are four programs, uh, one that covers the basics of money, that one that covers the basics of investing, one that covers the basics of stock market investing, the other that covers the basics of real estate. Uh, and with these programs, there are self-study examinations that you can give your child to make sure that they know the material cold. Uh, two, these are college level concepts that I used to teach college students. I just broke them down where a seven year old can understand them. So basically your children are getting a head start. I'm not, we're not into equality or inclusion or diversity. We're into competition. So what we 
believe is that black people should not be trying to catch up. We should not be trying to be included. We should not be trying to be mixed in with a burning house. I believe black people should be fighting to get ahead. I believe that we should be trying to win. How do we win? Well, the master plan is, this is what I came up with in my own crazy warped little mind is I said, well, what if our kids started doing college level business and economic concepts when they're seven years old, six years old? White kids aren't doing that. So if we have our kids studying business at a high level at the age of six or seven, then they're going to be as good at business and economics as they are at basketball and football, which is going to make us the best in the world, just like we are at those sports. So basically, um, if you want to take a look at the program, uh, there, you, your kids can get a degree in each area, a certification in all four of those areas, uh, which, which is very good for their self-esteem. They can actually print out the certificate, get it framed, put it on their wall. If you come to my event, I'll sign it for them, all these things. Um, you can go to blackmillionairesoftomorrow.com. That's blackmillionairesoftomorrow.com. That's where you can get the discount. And the other thing about it is, uh, what was the other piece I was going to mention? Oh, once your child does that, please um, uh, put it up on social media, put up a picture of the degree or, or a bit, and maybe a video or an image, whatever you want to put up, something about it. Uh, testimonials are great when people talk about how much the program has helped them. Uh, and, uh, and use the hashtag Black Business School. I'm going to check that hashtag. Doesn't matter. It could be Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. It could be um, um, on YouTube, wherever you want to put it. So whichever way it inspires you to communicate, put something up, use that hashtag. I'm going to search that hashtag Black Business School, and I'm going to find that content and find all the people that we're helping so we can share that with as many people as possible so that other people can kind of see what Black economic empowerment has done for your family. OK, um, and then the other children's program we have is that BlackCEOFactory.com. That's just entrepreneurship. That's also 75% off. So if your child just wants to, to be a business owner and create a business, uh, go to blackceofactory.com. Uh, the cost, I don't have the cost right here in my head, uh, but it's 75% off the regular cost. So in, in, after um, after the end of the month, it goes back to the regular price. So uh, go go take a look, blackceofactory.com. You can take a look at the program, see everything it provides. Um, you know, we lay it all out there. Uh, the other thing too is I want the students to know um, that if you have any issues or any concerns or any questions or anything like that, Go to, um, we have an excellent uh, top-notch customer support team. We believe deeply in customer happiness because we know that we're operating in a, in a, in a tough space. It's tough to be a black business that's doing unconventional business, meaning that we're providing a low-cost, high-quality, black-centered alternative to a college education. So that means that naturally, there are going to be a lot of skeptics. There are going to be a lot of people who say, oh, those Negroes, they just making stuff up. Oh, they just out here scamming. They out here lying or whatever. So what we try to do to kind of deal with that, we, we prepared for this many years ago to preempt that. Our number one top investment we made in the company was in customer happiness and making sure that we have a customer support team so that if you're not sure about anything, you have any issues at all, can't log in, can't, you know, don't, not sure how to go through the program, have a question about the program, not, not sure about the price, your budget's short, and maybe you need us to cut you a break and, and, and give you a discount, email support at theblackbusinessschool.com. That's support at theblackbusinessschool.com. Don't forget that T-H-E, that's really important. Support at theblackbusinessschool.com. We literally have a bunch of people where all they do is they sit around and they wait to hear from you. Uh, so they can answer your questions and really help you out. So that's important so that if you're not sure, you know, so whenever we have a critic, we just tell them, we say, hey, come on in, like, try it out, you know, try something, you know, do a free sample, just jump in, and we can show you how great we are, so that you'll trust us as much as you trusted, um, you know, that white university that that billed you $200,000 for a bachelor's degree that got you a $40,000 a year job, right? So, so that's kind of how we operate in the Black Business School. That's what we do. We're here for you 100% of the time. All we focus on and obsess about are Black people. We're not, you know, a big university that's letting Black people in to be nice. We are here for Black people, and that's 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 who we're here to educate. That's what our mission is, and that's why we exist. So, um, anyway, that's it. Um, um, so uh, I, I see you guys in, uh, that are moderating, that are that are defending uh, the kingdom. I appreciate that. But one thing I will tell you is. Um, you know, keep doing that. I mean, I think that's great. Like join those conversations. Like when you hear, if you hear somebody say, oh, that old black business school, they're just full of crap. These Negroes and blah, blah, blah. You know, I say, go back to uh, like what they say in the Bible, like forgive them for they know not what they do. Um, you know, cause, cause the brainwashing is deep. You know, there's a lot of, uh, work that's been put into making black people scared of each other. There's a lot of work that's been put into making black people not trust one another. There's a lot of the work that's put into, 
um, making sure that we're far more skeptical of black businesses than we are of white businesses. Because there are a lot of white businesses that are doing terrible things to black people and aren't putting any money back into the black community. And so um, when people say something that doesn't make any sense or they're like, oh, that sounds like a bunch of BS or whatever, just tell them, just go and tell them your experience. Just say, um, you know, I um, I put my child through the program. Now my child is 13 years old and they understand real estate at a high level and uh, their friends don't know anything about the things that my child understands. And my child goes to the playground every day and he brags about how he's he's now an investor and all this other stuff. Um, in fact, there was a little girl, um, uh, not sorry, not a little girl, it was a little boy, uh, one of the moms last year, a year over a year ago, and uh, she told me, I, I had told all the parents in the program, I said, for Christmas, get your child like a share of stock, like get them a share of stock and talk them through it, tell them what it means to be an owner and all this other stuff. Like I did that with um with one of the kids in our house. Uh, I, I, I uh, We were in line at McDonald's and I said, um, I was explaining stocks and what it means to own a company and all the, and get a share of the profits. And she's very smart. She makes straight A's. She's, she's probably the smartest one of the, of the three kids. And um, and uh, and she could conceptualize what it means to own a share of stock. And I said, well, actually, you can buy a share of stock really easily. And she said, really? How? I said, well, we're in line at McDonald's. I said, how about we buy some McDonald's stock right now? She said, you can do that? I said, yeah. So I pulled out my app and we bought 10 shares of McDonald's stock just right there. Like right there, we bought uh, 10 shares of stock. And so uh, ultimately, um, ultimately, it, you know, that allowed her to understand what that means, what ownership means. Uh, there was another mom who told me that her son, uh, when, when she bought him a share of stock, she heard her son on the playground and he was talking to his friends and his friends were like, yeah, my, I got a video game. Oh yeah, I got some new Jordans or whatever they got for Christmas. And, um, and, uh, and so she heard her son, her son said, uh, well, I, for Christmas, I got some Nintendo stock. So you got a Nintendo game. So whenever Nintendo makes money, I make money. But, you know, and, and it was kind of funny because he sounded very confident when he said it. You know, so a lot of times kind of getting your kid into these other ways to make money at an early age, gets, you know, it changes them forever. It shifts their DNA in terms of how they view themselves, how they view life, how they view the world. Uh, let's see here. Um, let's see, beloved, it's an accredited college. I don't know what that, uh, I don't know what that comment means. Uh, Jacob, I'm so, or Jeffrey, I'm so sorry. Jacob, uh, A, B, and C 2019. Yeah, if you want to um, get advanced tickets to the All Black National Convention for 2019, we're probably going to, we're going to look to do it in Philadelphia again. We just like Philly so much. If you go to allblacknationalconvention.com, you can actually get advanced tickets uh, at a huge discount. So feel free if you are a person that went last year and you want to come back next year, or if you haven't gone um, and you want to be there, um, it's, it's amazing. There are vendors there. There are all different kinds of crazy things, amazing ways for Black people to network and work together at the convention. It's really a great feeling. It's like a family reunion. Uh, will the Black Business School offer degrees one day? I sure hope my son can use this as an alternative to college. Well, you know, Tina, one of our fundamental beliefs is that we don't believe um, in trying to seek out accreditation uh, from the existing system. That's not what we do. Um, we believe in, in creating accreditation processes. We believe that these uh, universities out here are not qualified. They've proven themselves to not be adequately, adequately qualified to train Black people to rebuild the Black community. So I am not a person who is a fan of seeking accreditation because I don't want our school to be like everybody else's school because everybody else's, those other schools are failing. Those other schools are not working. So, um, you know, so we create, we have, we give our own degrees and certificates. Uh, we can accredit other people to do the same thing, but we don't, we, we're not chasing accreditation. Um, and also the other thing about uh, building your own system is that you get away from a space where a piece of paper is going to open doors for you necessarily. I mean, you know, it's like a college degree is designed to give you, it's like a ticket for an, a pre-existing economic system, the one that's sort of all around you in the United States the one that's controlled by mostly white people, to be honest with you. And uh, and once you leave that system, that piece of paper has very little value, right? That piece of paper doesn't matter if you're an entrepreneur. Um, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, all that matters is whether or not you can provide a high quality product at a, at a fair price and find a customer base. That's all your customers care about. They don't care if you went to Stanford. They don't care if you uh, have a bachelor's degree or not. They don't care. All they care about is whether or not the, you know, the can of beans they bought from you tastes good or doesn't taste good and if the price is fair, right? So basically, 
um, when you're diff when you're separating yourself from a system, which I believe is the answer to oppression. I believe the answer to white supremacy is to get out of white supremacist systems. I believe that it's just like if a building is is uh, poisoned with asbestos, um, the best way to protect yourself is to get out of that building. It's not to just you know breathe differently or to um, stay out of the room where the asbestos asbestos is. The asbestos is all throughout the building. So you probably want to get out of the building and build your own house. So we believe the white, white supremacy infects the entire economic system, the entire economic system and political system and educational system are all these like these big buildings that are infected with this asbestos. And if you don't get out of that building, you're going to be infected too. You leaving, Nana? Bye. That's my, that's my future mother-in-law. She is uh, heading out the door. So I had to say goodbye and blow her a kiss because I love her like that. She gave birth to the most beautiful woman in the world, so she deserves that respect. Um, let me see here. Charles says, how do you avoid overwhelm in terms of managing debt while at the same time trying to build wealth? Um, I would say try to do what you can. And also, Charles, what I would suggest heavily is to remember that you know, building wealth and capital, wealth and capital are almost never, uh, they almost never have anything to do with money. You know, try to think about all the ways that you have wealth and capital that does not involve money. For example, if you've got free time, well, that's capital. Why do, why do companies pay you by the hour or pay you for your time? Because your time has value. They take that time and they invest it into something and they make a profit from that investment, right? So the same way they can make a profit from your, your time, you can make a profit from your time. You just want to understand economics well enough to build a strong enough economic engine to help you build those profits. Um, or to, to generate that income from that free time. So you may want to start by joining a group <clears throat> of other entrepreneurs so that you can sit around and talk to people about things they have going on. So you may find somebody that has plenty of, of, of cash who's looking for somebody that's got plenty of time. So maybe you say, hey, I've got time and I've got skill. That's another form of capital. If you've been reading books and learning skills, whether it's programming a computer or doing yard work, and you say, hey, I got a skill, I can fix, a, I can fix bathrooms, right? And, and, I, and I got time and they say, oh, well, I got capital. I can do the marketing, right? Or I got customers over here that need their bathrooms fixed so I can pay you and you can, right? You know, then, then that's how you form uh, those connections that allow you to make money. Now, when it comes to debt, the thing about debt is that debt is either um, big or small, depending on what kind of income you have. So if, you're, if, you, if you can increase your income, a lot of times that can take a big debt and make it look small. So that was how I attacked my student loans. I said, man, if I'm paying these big ass student loans, with this salary over here, I'm going to be paying until I'm 70 years old. I'm not trying to do that. So I realized, okay, well, if I figure out how to increase my income, then I can attack the debt at a much more aggressive level, right? So basically, um, remember, there's many, many ways to, sk to skin a cat. And I'm going to break this down, actually, in a lecture I'm going to do for the Black Business School students, um, which you should, you should join the Black Business School so you can be a part of this lecture. I'm going to do it free for everybody that's in the school, so it won't cost you anything. But it's really literally a model that I came up with when I was out um, at Christmas Day with my family. We went to this play at this place called Drury Lane. And we just watched this really boring play. It was Beauty and the Beast. But it, it was well done. It was just boring. And I, so when I was bored to occupy my mind, I was thinking about simple, like simple models for wealth building. As you know, we have other models. We have the KID model for um, turning your child into a millionaire. Uh, that lecture is actually in the Black Business School. Uh, we have the cost model cooperative economics, COST. We have the poise model for children uh, in terms of building wealth, uh, poise, P-O-I-S-E, telling your kids to keep their poise, producer, owner, investor, savior, entrepreneur. We have all different kinds of models. So, so this KEG model, the keep, earn, grow model, I said, you know, if a person understands these three concepts at a deep level, then they can become a master wealth builder, right? So, uh, it, and the reason I think these simple models are so important is because it can take what's very complicated to you and make it very, very simple, where you can say, if I just follow these very basic ideas, then I can actually grow, uh, you know, a lot of wealth. Or So a lot of times with debt or with income and all that, remember, a lot of people will say things, for example, like Dave Ramsey, uh, who's a financial expert, he'll come out and he'll say, um, you know, uh, here are ways you can cut your debt, you know, get rid of all your debt. Right. Or here's ways to cut your expenses. You got to cut your expenses. If you don't trim your belt, then you're not going to have, you know, any extra money. And I was like, actually, that's not true. I don't like trimming my belt. I actually am not a good saver. I don't enjoy living like a miser. That's not fun for me. Like y'all, some, some people made fun of me on my Instagram 
because I took pictures of all the presents that we got the kids. Now, I didn't tell everybody the grandma actually bought most of the stuff. But still, they were like, oh, boy, so you're talking about financial intelligence. And here you are. You spent all this money on this pagan holiday, blah, blah. And I said, first of all, number one, I ain't got to be serious 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's going to give you a heart attack at an early age. So so I was like, get off my back. Stop being so serious all damn time. But then number two, I say Christmas is fine. There's nothing wrong with celebrating Christmas. There's nothing wrong with enjoying Christmas. It's about moderation. You know, you save and invest first, then you can enjoy your money. So if, I, if you've ever gotten the impression from me that I don't believe you should enjoy your money, then I need you to kill that right now. I want you to have fun. I want you to go buy with the car that you want to get. I want you to get the shoes you want to get. I want you to go on vacation, spend what you want to spend. Just handle your business first. But then the third piece that got me um, was I said, you know, people think that the only way to have more money is to save more. And I said, that's not really true. Actually, you don't have to always save more. If you earn more, then you can keep saving the same amount. Or actually, if you earn more, then you keep spending what you were already spending before and you can, your savings can still grow. So a person who's making, say, $3,000 a month, if they're, if, they're, if they're mad, like they're like, gosh, I'm saving $200 a month. I should be saving $500 a month. Well, if they find a way to make $4,000 a month, then they can keep spending. They can actually spend a whole $3,000 a month. They can spend every penny of what they were making before and still be a master saver, still be saving $1,000 a month. So maybe instead of always putting your energy into cutting down, thinking in a scarcity mindset, maybe it's okay to also think in an abundance mindset. If you increase your income, then you don't have to necessarily tighten your belt all the time. Doesn't mean you, you know, you, you can be irresponsible, but there are different ways that you can skin that cat. There's not one way to skin that cat. And that's the point. Right. So if you know all the different ways that wealth is grown, then you know which different levers you can pull to allow you to put yourself in a better economic position. Because that's all a car dealer does. I, I went to go get a car last week. It was my first car I've owned since 2007. I had to give my car away many years ago because I I'd quit my job and started my business. And I was or actually I wasn't making as much money. I was spending all my money in my business and I just didn't have any money for a car. So I literally told them to just take it away. So I, I didn't have I didn't have a car for 11 years. Cause I just didn't. And, and eventually, even when I had the money to buy one, I was like, I don't want one now. But anyway, I finally went and bought a car. And the thing about buying a car is that they, they, the, the, the dealer knows different levers they can pull, right? So if they say, well, you know, the payment on this car is $400 a month. And you say, well, I can't afford 400 a month. They say, well, how much can you afford? You say, I can only afford 350. So they'll come back and they'll say, oh, okay, sure. We can get it to 350. Right. And some people who aren't thinking, they're thinking that they reduce the price of the car, but they didn't actually reduce the price of the car. They changed, they pulled a lever, they changed a variable. Typically the variable they change is they will extend the life of the loan. So you're, you're now borrowing more money or you're borrowing over a longer period of time than you would have borrowed before, right? So you're gonna pay more interest that way, right? Or maybe they change your down payment or whatever it is, right? If you change different levers, then you can change whatever number you wanna change. So a lot of times I think knowing where these levers exist in your life, it allows you to say, you know, I'm not really a big saver. I, I really kind of like, you know, buying Gucci shoes or I like eating out or whatever. And you say, I'm a, how do I still eat out but I'm gonna go and, um, I, and and still make sure I can save. Oh, I know what I can do. I can go find a way to use my, my resources, my capital and invest that capital in a way that will increase my income. Well, you know, if you only know how to make money through a job, then your only options for increasing your income are get a better job, work more hours on your job, get a second job, right? Or ask your boss to give you a raise. Those are the only options you have. Problem with that is you become a one trick pony. You don't have all the options you have. You can't pull all the levers on income, right? So. Uh, a, a wealth builder, what a wealth builder does, in a, an entrepreneur does, as, a, as an entrepreneur knows, yeah, I could get a better job and make more money on the job or whatever it is, but I can also go in and, and invest in a new business model that, that will allow me to create another stream of income. I could uh, expand my customer base somehow. I could form a really productive partnership with somebody that will help us to all make more money. I could cut my costs in my business so that I can increase my profitability. I can reduce my marketing spend so that I have excess cash flow that allows me to then do whatever I'm going to do. Right? That, like a person who is a wealth builder knows all the levers they can pull to achieve that goal so that at the end of the day, they can still buy the Gucci shoes and still keep their savings where it is, right? Um, uh, a good, another good analogy is that, you know, in my weight loss journey, you guys have seen me uh, as I've been telling you guys about, you know, how I'm now running and all this other stuff and trying to lose weight. And it's been working, right? I lost a lot of weight and feeling better. Blood pressure went from extremely high to perfect. It literally 120 over 70. I couldn't believe it when the doctor told me I was so excited. Anyway, here's the thing, right? I like to eat, you know, I like, I like um, candy, 
I love, like Twizzlers and Skittles, stuff like that. Um, I don't want to be on a diet all the time. I don't like diet soda. I do not like um, eating health food all the time. Um, sometimes I just want to, I really do just kind of want that cheeseburger, right? And I, you ain't going to make me feel bad about eating that cheeseburger. I'm sorry. It, ain't, it just ain't going to work, right? Well, pull the different levers, right? How can I have a cheeseburger every now and then and still not, you know, lose my uh, ability to achieve my goal of weight loss? Well, you know, that's where running that extra mile might make a difference. I'll be like, okay, well, let me run six miles instead of four because I ate that ice cream yesterday, right? So, Basically, um, freedom is typically something, this is where the cost model of cooperative economics comes from. Some of you guys may know that model. Uh, we teach it in the Black Business School. But basically, cost model, the cost model is built around this idea that says, you pay the cost to be the boss. Anything you want, uh, if you want power, there's a cost for that. Are you willing to pay the price? You want freedom? What is the cost for that? You got to pay the price. Uh, you want luxury? Sure, you can have that, but there's a cost for that. You got to pay the price. If I want to eat Twizzlers and Skittles and 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 ice cream every now and then? Yeah, I can do that, but there's a cost for that. The question is, are you willing to pay the cost, right? Um, so for black people, here's the thing. We must understand that freedom is not free, that freedom does have a price, right? The problem for you, the reason you're confused, the reason that you feel so lost in this society is because somebody lied to you and told you that freedom is gonna come for nothing. They told you that uh, because you're just, because you've been exploited and because you're black and because you've been through all this hell, White people are going to miraculously wake up one day and just decide to share all their power and resources with you and to make your life wonderful. They're just going to start treating you well because it's the right thing to do. And then when it doesn't happen, you end up feeling mad and bitter. Like, man, these white people won't do what they're supposed to do. Blah, blah, blah. But the thing is, a person who understands cost understands that if I want to truly be free from the system, I'm going to have to make some tough decisions. If I want to be free from this oppression, I'm going to have to make some hard investments. If I really want to fight through all of this, I'm going to have to be 10 times better and work 10 times harder than the white man to overcome all the systems and traps he has in place to control me, right? So when I was young, that's what I did. I, my thought was, as a young black man, um, I'm going to study harder than the white boys. I'm going to... Um, I'm not going to make some dumbass decisions. You're not going to hear about me getting shot at the club when I was half drunk, you know, whatever, or getting locked up because I did something crazy or stupid, right? Um, I'm going to uh, save and invest as much as I can. I'm going to learn all the different ways to build wealth and make money and all this other stuff uh, because I know that in order for me to be this free, and I feel very free, like I say what I want. I don't feel like anybody controls me. I do what I want with my time, um, but I know that this freedom has a price to it. And if, and if the day ever came where I wasn't willing to pay the price for that freedom, then I would sacrifice my freedom, give it up, hand it over, and just accept the idea that I'm going to be in a deeper form of slavery. Some NFL players, I don't think, get that. Like, that's why they were so mad, because they were kneeling, and the owners were, like, pressuring them and saying, you're going to get fired if you keep kneeling. And we're like, oh, but, but freedom of speech, we're supposed to have freedom of speech. And, and, and people like that, I think, don't understand the realities of the world. That freedom of speech, there's no such thing as freedom of speech. There's no such thing as absolute freedom. And freedom that is given freely and easily, typically is freedom that's easily taken away. Black people got freedom pretty easily, so-called freedom, of the illusion of freedom, easily through integration. But the huge price for that freedom was, uh, was that it was easily taken away. And it also came with a commitment to serving the white supremacist ecosystem, uh, which we've done for the last 50, 60 years. Okay, so anyway, um, let me see here. Uh, I saw some other questions. Okay, so the stock market program, yeah, if you want to get a discount on the stock market program, feel free. Go to theblackstockmarketprogram.com. That's theblackstockmarketprogram.com. What's the best course for learning entrepreneurship? That's blackmoney103.com. That's uh, blackmoney103 is the third class in our black money sequence. So if you go to blackmoney103.com, and there's a ton of content in there. We have a great lawyer that teaches all kinds of great stuff. Uh, and I'm looking at the page, and it looks like the first month is free. So just feel free to give that a try at blackmoney103.com. Um, okay. All right. So I'm okay. Trump is promoting apprenticeship programs for the youth. What's your view on that? Um, I, you know, I, I don't necessarily, I wouldn't sign up for that. Um, I don't think it, I, I don't really know exactly how black people could benefit from that. I would want to be a part of this administration because I think it's kind of chaotic and very volatile and not healthy for the American people. But, um, then again, though, um, that's just my take on it. Um, 
All right. So let's see here. Uh, Edward says, hello, boys. Uh, could you shout out my business? I'm having a FUBU uh, for us by us holiday sale. Health by any means necessary. OK, yeah, this brother, Edward Williams. Edward, did you send me that email, man? It's email my assistant, assistant at voicewalkers.com. If she don't respond to you, you hit her back because I, I want you on I want you on my YouTube channel, man. I, I have met this brother and I'm so impressed with you. Um, help by any means necessary. The website, write this down. It's hbamn.com, hbamn.com, which stands for health by any means necessary. And this brother uh, knows a lot about health and, um, and, and he just gave, he was just dropping major game about blood pressure and diabetes and heart disease. And he's got a business around it. His energy is wonderful. And I just love seeing a black man on top of his game, you know? So, um, so brothers, I, I, I'm going to bring this brother into the channel. I want you guys to pay attention because, uh, this is how you, this is how you win. This is how you succeed. Uh, Jandel Benjamin, uh, but some people cannot eat that one cheeseburger. They don't have that control. That's so true. I agree. And maybe I'm one of those people because I, I like some good food. I don't know about y'all, but I do. I ain't gonna lie. All right. So anyway, I'm about to get out of here, guys. I got to go meet the, the queen and we're about to uh, drive to visit my parents in Kentucky. So um, um, uh, that's it. Um, I hope this was helpful. I hope this was a helpful conversation. Once again, if you uh, want to check out the stock market program and the discount that's there, it's it's good for this month only. Uh, feel free to go to theblackstockmarketprogram.com. It's theblackstockmarketprogram.com. Uh, all of our programs have a 30-day, 100% money-back guarantee. So that means if you're not happy for any reason, you can let us know. Uh, and uh, you can also get a degree from the Black Business School once you're done. Make sure you get that degree. And whatever you're doing, if the Black Business School has changed your life, made your life better, uh, please shout it out. Shout it to the to the rooftops. Go to social media right now if you can and just say something good about what you've gained from this conversation. And you can hashtag, um, hashtag uh, one of two things or both if you want. Hashtag Dr. Boyce Watkins, me, and I'll check the hashtag. Or you can also hashtag Black Business School, either Black Business School or the Black Business School, or you can do both. It's up to you. Um, but uh, but I like these uh, I like these videos and and pictures and commentary and everything else because that really helps us to um, we can drown out any negativity with just love and positivity. Um, so uh, that's you know one of the things I want to do is make sure that anybody who's not sure anybody who is is thinking oh this is too good to be true or oh there must be something bad about this I want those people to just see all the people that we've helped so that uh, we can make sure that they know that we can help them too. Um, I don't want you sitting there mad and, and negative and upset because we're, we're doing well or because we're succeeding. I want you to join us. I want you to be uh, part of this movement. I want to help you um, and I want to help ease your pain. Whatever pain is causing you to, to lash out at other black people, I want to see that pain get dealt with so that you're doing so well and you're so happy and you're doing you're so prosperous and you're so successful that you can only wish other black people well. And that's what we want to aim for in the community. So I just want you guys to know that in my journey, in terms of trying to figure out, like, how do you deal with with people that just are mad just for whatever reason? Um, I said, you know, I think we can we can we, we shouldn't battle hate with hate. We shouldn't fight fire with fire. You fight fire with water. You fight hate with love. So we're going out. We're going to love the shit out of these people, whether they like it or not. So that's what I'm committed to. 2019 is the year of love for me and for you, and for everybody. And uh, if you all ever catch me losing that love spirit, I want you all to check me and kind of say, OK, boys, you know, we're, we're all about love. We're all about productivity. Let's love each other. Let's be productive and let's love them so much that they're going to if we get on their nerves, it'll be because we're, we're just so damn happy and we want them to do well. And they just can't take it because they're not used to seeing that. So anyway, that's it. I'm out. Take care, guys. And I'll have a great day and I'll see you soon.